Um, so ba based on the conversations we had in plenary one, we now want to take this more high level uh, policy de uh, debate and discussion to the real practical implementation of sustainable and smart city practices, um, like they're happening now, but also what's planned in the future. Uh, for that purpose, we have four high level representatives of um, four European cities. Um, so one representative per city who will give us a presentation uh, on their experiences and on the, on the matters and um, uh, practices that they implemented. Um, in that, we want to take you a bit on a journey because um, you will uh, probably know that there are, are um, lighthouse cities and fellow cities. Um, and we want to hear from both. Uh, and we will start actually with a fellow city, which is the host city um, of the Urbis Pair, which is um, Brno. And we will hear um, from Mr. Hvatal, uh, um, who is the deputy mayor, and um, Brno itself is part of the Ruggedized project. Um, and we want to hear from the experiences there. We will then hear from a second fellow city, um, which is the city of Budapest, uh, where Mr. Kerpel Fonius is going to share his um, experience also there in terms of planning um, uh, smart city um, solutions. And then we'll take the journey to a different level, uh, where we'll hear from the city of Leipzig, who has been a, um, a fellow city in the project called Triangulum, but since then has moved on to become a lighthouse city in the Sparks project, so has the experience of both sides. And that's, of course, a very interesting um, experience to share and to learn um, from cities that are maybe already fellow cities and uh, aspire to become lighthouse cities uh, in the near future. And then to round uh, the, the journey off, we hear from Tartu, uh, from Mr. Tam, um, so uh, from a lighthouse city that has, of course, already a lot of practical experience in implementing um, uh, different solutions and different actions um, and as such of course a lot to share in terms of the maybe the challenges but also the opportunities these uh, um, impl implementation has uh, cost them or has uh, they have faced with so uh, we see that as really as a journey um, for you to 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 follow um, and then to also of course the session is um, set up in a way that we will first hear all four presentations one after the other um, and that afterwards we will go uh, into a bit more interaction with you as the audience. However, if you already have a question along the way, you're very much invited to use the question uh, panel, which is on your left side of the screen. Uh, you can just type in the question there. Uh, and at the end of the session, we will select a few of the questions to be posed then to our speakers. Uh, and get their opinions on or get you the answers that you were always looking forward to get. So whenever you have a question during the whole session, even during the presentations, you get a chance to pose your question in the question box uh, and then we will pick a few um, at the end of the session. But that without um, making this introduction much longer, um, I would like to invite Mr. Kvartal to turn on his camera and microphone. He's joining us from the stage, the main stage in Bruno. And I would like to ask you to please um, do your presentation with us on operating Bruno in the Hogadise. Hello, thank you. Thank you very much. My name is Philip Hvatal. I am the member of City Council for Urban Planning and uh, Development. And uh, I would like to um, uh, present our uh, concrete project, which is called Spitalka, which is the small city district, uh, the part of the city, which is uh, nowadays a brownfield. Um, uh, can, in, can we turn the next uh, the next slide? So this is this is the place uh, in our city. As you see on the map, uh, this is the uh, former uh, heating plant, uh, which belongs to the city firm, which is 100% owned by the city. The the, uh, the the heating company, and uh, as you see in the map, uh, there are no streets, no connections to to the rest of the city. So, uh, as the first place, uh, as the as the first step, we did uh, the urban competition. So, uh, the next uh, the next slide, please. Um, the, here you see here you see our um, 
terms, our our steps we will do, we, we did and we will do. So on the next slide, uh, you can see the first step. So the first step was in 2018. It was an, uh, it was an international open urban design idea competition. Uh, you see the jury also on the photograph. Uh, there were people, uh, the, the chairwoman, uh, the chairwoman of the jury was the uh, person from Rotterdam, which is a lighthouse city, uh, uh, something like the very good example for us. Uh, uh, also, uh, our chief architect, Mr. Serlacek, uh, colleagues from Austria, from two cities, from city of, uh, thank you, thank you, cities from Graz and from Vienna, which are also very good examples for our city. Uh, Graz is almost the same size as we are, and Vienna have very good historical connections. Also, the architects were almost uh, very often very similar architects from Vienna and from Bernau in the history. Urbanism and uh, all these things are uh, in very similar way. Uh, also, there is a deputy mayor from the city of Prague, former chief architect of Prague, Mr. Hlavacek. Uh, our mayor uh, from the city district, from the biggest city district, which is Brno Middle, and me and my colleague, uh, Deputy Mayor Mr. Lagik, which was in the former session. So this was the uh, this was the winner on the second uh, picture. You see, it was mainly focused on the whole urbanism of the of the whole uh, city size, but it was something like an inspiration. It was not the concept we uh, totally. Um, uh, uh, take and implement. So, next slide, please. Uh, the next step uh, was uh, the urban study, uh, because the, uh, this part of the city is really complicated, and uh, we had to make an urban study, which was which is uh, uh, which is a foundation for the urban plan we did now. So the first step was to make an urban study uh, to uh, save the streets, the new streets, also uh, in um, in connection to the ownership, where it's quite uh, specific and very complicated ownership structure so we did the uh, setting of, of these streets uh, of the squares and mainly on the connection of the whole place because without the connection to uh, to the main street we cannot develop this place uh, anyway uh, and also uh, the second step we did was parallelly almost parallelly uh, the master plan uh, we can take the next slide. Uh, the master plan of uh, master plan of this uh, city district is uh, connected uh, with uh, with the uh, culture hub, with the event hub, and with the uh, with the co-working hub. This was something like a uh, focus from the architects to have uh, an idea what the city wants from this core place in the middle of the in the middle of the city district. This is not the only place we develop. We develop also the others, but this hub should be something like a magnet, like an accelerator for the whole place, which will be in the surrounding mainly for living or for some small shops, but mainly for living. So uh, you can see on the picture uh, the main part, uh, main part of the uh, of the uh, of the place, which is. Uh, just the core place which belongs to the city. The other, uh, the other ownerships, the other uh, places are not uh, in the uh, in the hand of of the city. Uh, a little bit back to the competition. There were 27 proposals, and uh, almost in every step, the Rigidize project contributed to the development uh, of the area. Also, the chairwoman, uh, as I said before, from Rotterdam, were also part uh, part of the uh, of the project Rigidize. Uh, also, we did um, a small uh, visit, something like a cooperation with Rotterdam in 2019, uh, and we focus uh, on the public-private partnership and financing models and methods of engaging different stakeholders. We did now, so this were a big inspiration from Rotterdam. We want to implement now, uh, now in Brno. Uh, it was also on the picture on the picture before. Uh, we uh, 
establish a project team, which is very important thing. Uh, the project team will be now uh, connected with the um, uh, heating company because nowadays this place belongs to the heating company. So if we want to begin to rebuild the brownfield, we have to begin it with the heating company. So the project team will be connected now with the heating company, which will be also from architects, from the urban planners and from uh, from the people which have focused on economy, that the model will be sustainable. Next, next slide, please. Uh, now, uh, now we have also an uh, expert tables. Uh, we have uh, six topics in total. Uh, in total, uh, we uh, will be covered. They, they will covered with one expert uh, table discussion. When from outputs uh, will lead to a closer specification of technologies and approaches we will applicate uh, in the city districts. So, uh, this is what we want to uh, uh, focus with. What we want to. Uh, also uh, discuss in these roundtables to have a better idea what the technologies we want to implement in this place. Also, uh, back uh, when I can take the slide back, uh, back uh, as you see, as you see the picture, uh, the uh, the existing place have some uh, buildings we want to save. We want to re re recover them. Uh, in the middle of the place, you see the cooling tower of the heating plant, which is something like a symbol of the whole district of the Spitalka. There were also big discussions if we want to save it or not, if it has something like a symbol um, a value or not. But at the end, uh, we decided to save this place and reconstruct it. In this, uh, in this cooling tower should be something like an event hub. Uh, which will be uh, connected with the other buildings to present uh, small uh, entertainers and uh, entertainments uh, in this in, in this event hub. Uh, on the next uh, on the next um, uh, in the next building, uh, there is an uh, cover hub uh, and uh, also uh, the culture hub. There is something like a building. I cannot show it to you, uh, but uh, on the left side from uh, from from the uh, from the cooling plant, from the cooling tower, there is a uh, culture hub uh, where should be uh, something like uh, concerts and things like uh, this to also focus people to come to this uh, to this place. Uh, so this is something like a uh, main concept on, on the main master plan. Now we want to uh, make uh, economic analysis of this master plan. Now it's mainly an architecture, the concept of these three hubs, and uh, we will we will make an economic analysis analysis to uh, to uh, uh, to uh, decide if it's uh, sustainable uh, sustainable or not. Uh, the module housing uh, capacity is now uh, approximately between five hundred. 500,900 uh, 500 and 900 citizens in this small place. Not the others uh, places. Uh, there will be uh, more more inhabitants in the surrounding. Okay, so. Uh, Next slide, and uh, then the next slide. Uh, so, um, uh, in this uh, next year, we will start uh, uh, looking for a long-term investor and potential ways of financing the project from European funds, which is very important now, because we want to make with lawyers and with economists um, the concept uh, that will be the base uh, for uh, for the uh, for the uh, negotiation with uh, negotiation with uh, with the uh, private sector because uh, without the private sector I uh, we think that uh, this um, project will be not uh, possible to build it will it will cost a lot of a uh, lot of uh, finances uh, we are aware that if we don't want Spitalka to become an ordinary development project we need to continue to cooperate with. European course and project and look for sustainable, suitable business models. So uh, now is uh, the time we prepare uh, the long-term investor uh, uh, and the negotiation with the long-term investor to, to this place. So the base is now the urban study. After then, we change the urban plan and we focus now on the master plan, which will be the base for the negotiation uh, with, uh, with the private sector. 
So, uh, and we also have a good example from our partner city of Leipzig, who have become a lighthouse city after being a fellow city. So, uh, these are the main, uh, the main steps we did and we, uh, we are, uh, waiting for. And I think, uh, the next slide, uh, is, uh, uh the, the last one. So thank you for your attention and, uh, I'm looking forward for the discussion. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Khwadal, uh, for this uh, for this presentation and for sharing uh, the plans uh, that you have over there in Brno and the experience already um, moving towards implementation. Thank you very much. Um, could I then ask the technicians in uh, Brno to turn off sound and video? For the moment, we'll bring back Mr. Khwadal later for the discussions. Um, and I would like to ask our uh, second presenter, Mr. Careful, uh, Fronius, to uh, turn on his camera and sound. Perfect. Thank you. Um, welcome. Uh, and the floor is yours. You can move the slides yourself by just moving the arrows um, left, um, left and right, or up and down, whatever works for you. Okay, but uh, where can I find my presentation? Because you just, um, you, just, you just move ahead. Yours is the next one to come up. Okay, good. Thank you very much for the invitation. I'm quite honored to speak on this uh, occasion. I would like to speak about uh, uh, two ongoing projects that we have, and then I would like uh, to speak uh, about the future a bit. Uh, the first one is a mobility project. Uh, it is the uh, Cities for People project, um, in which we try to... Um, handle the situation where uh, Budapest uh, roads are overcrowded with private cars and we would like to reduce the traffic somewhat and therefore we would like to understand how people use uh, public transport and also how they use um, uh, last mile instruments like, uh, uh, like rental bicycles or um, or other uh, last mile vehicles. This is an ongoing project. Uh, it has first started uh, two years ago, where we uh, uh, created uh, one mobility point where um, you could switch modes from public transport, train or bus or uh, tram uh, to rental bikes or car sharing cars. Um, and also, we tried to limit the traffic on the K uh, um, on the Danube and to give it back to pedestrians. The results were quite favorable. So uh, this year, our experiment was a bit developed further. We uh, implemented a test of four or five uh, mobility points, which are Again, points where uh, you can switch uh, transport modes, uh, but also we were, we were able to uh, examine uh, the behavior of uh, the users um, in, as, in as much as um, to how to identify, or um, not how to identify, but actually to identify patterns of usage when uh, these, uh, when these, uh, uh, when these vehicles are actually used uh, in a network. And the good thing is that uh, quite a lot of providers agreed to cooperate and they also agreed uh, to share all their data with the, uh, with the public transport agency in Budapest. Uh, so we are now examining the data, but the feedback is very, uh, uh, is very good. So now we are even enhancing this in one of the districts, a downtown district. Uh, we are scaling up the uh, experiment uh, to have uh, 86 mobility points implemented. There we would like uh, to, to test uh, the usage of these vehicles in a much uh, greater uh, spatial area. And also uh, one of the things is that we are uh, testing the new regulations of how uh, to to regulate um, uh, where these vehicles can actually be put down. So uh, the usage of uh, previously unused pavement areas uh, to uh, to store rental bikes and things like that to to restore a bit of order so that these vehicles do not uh, uh, remain. Uh, 
uh, left around, scattered around. So it, uh, it appears that there is a win-win situation. There's a very good uh, cooperation with mobility service providers and uh, the uh, city, uh, city inhabitants, the citizens are very, uh, uh are, are are getting used to using these last mile uh things so this is one experiment uh that we are doing and we are planning to enhance this um uh, and to uh use these solutions over uh, an ever increasing part of the downtown area of budapest the second ongoing project is the atelier uh project which is uh, a lighthouse uh, which is uh, following Amsterdam and Bilbao in an effort to create a positive energy district. This is a plan that is ranging to uh, 2050 on the level of Budapest. We are now uh, implementing uh, the replication plans for two selected target areas in Budapest where we are actually uh, implementing uh, things that have been experimented on in uh, Bilbao and Amsterdam, and we are uh, trying to examine how this works in a somewhat different uh, Hungarian uh, uh, energy mix and also a cultural background. One of the uh, main aims of this, uh, of this project is to engage citizens uh, in the process of uh, urban energy transformation and also to raise their aware of, awareness to the importance of this problem. And also we uh, have to uh, reduce our backlog in identifying uh, our urban energy system and to start conversations with key stakeholders. So this is a very long uh, project with which we have uh, begun only recently. Uh, as to the general uh, situation in, uh, in, uh, uh, in uh, Budapest, we have to focus on uh, the development on small and medium enterprises in which Budapest was not particularly good uh, in the, uh, in the pre, uh, under the previous administration and it turned out uh, under the covid uh, situation that we will have to uh, that we will have to uh, focus much more uh, on the aid given by the city to uh, to enterprises that would not uh, get uh, very much help from the uh, uh, for, from the for-profit uh, uh, incubating programs. These are companies which have a very strong focus on uh, local administration and community uh, developments. So uh, we, have to, uh, uh, we have to give them uh, incubatory help and also, uh, also uh, help them uh, with uh, micro, uh, microfinancing. And one of the major impacts uh, that COVID had was that we realized that uh, digitalization of public administration and the city services uh, is very underdeveloped. So we have to work on that very hard. So we are, uh, we are starting to focus uh, on that. Uh, a major problem in Budapest that we have uh, recently identified is that uh, Budapest, as much of Hungary, is a very controlling environment and in this sense it is not uh, very good in reacting to the swift transformation of uh, all the technological developments, developments in thoughts and approaches. So uh, any kind of development that is going on in Budapest is mostly controlled by Budapest and uh, our major goal now in the future years is to transform the approach of Budapest from being a controlling environment to be a host environment in which it encourages uh, uh, for-profit, non-profit enterprises, uh, communities to develop services and to host these services rather than uh, wanting to uh, implement uh, services by the city on its own. 
we want to introduce uh, new ways of thought in the governance of Budapest. So we are very keen on organizing hackathons in different uh, uh, in different uh, domains, so we can uh, gather ideas and gather um, gather ways of uh, development. And when uh, these hackathons actually come up with some uh, with reasonable things, then uh, our approach is to create pilot projects and to see these through and uh, try to support these from the idea formulation through the testing and to a, a full-scale uh, rollout. Um, and uh, so um, in the environment that we are in, uh, Budapest being such a controlling thing, we always, uh, the previous administration always wanted to implement uh, the perfect solution, whereas our approach is uh, much more on uh, uh, implementing changes through trial and error methodology to always be open uh, to the possibility of correction, not always implementing uh, final solutions, but implementing changes uh, in a gradual way. Uh, first, trying to influence users and then uh, uh, doing the building works. So um, a whole new culture is uh, being introduced and that is the, uh, that is the essence of our uh, smart city approach. Um, it is not a very uh, technological minded, it is much more uh, focused on sustainability and also the particip uh, also to uh, improve the participation of the citizens in formulating the goals and creating the solutions that we are using. And uh, uh, of course, uh, an agile approach is very hard to follow due to the rigid uh, budgeting system and public procurement uh, practices. Um, but we will have to uh, try to wriggle our way out of uh, these constraints. And also, during this process, we will have to uh, uh, change our decision making in a direction of uh, uh, being much more data based. It seems that uh, uh, the culture in Budapest is very, uh, is very limited in the sense of database decision making and uh, one of the main uh, goals is to create a data system where uh, the city administration and city uh, city decision makers are able to track the data that is created during the functioning uh, uh, of the city so and a few examples of what we are uh, trying to implement uh, through uh, this trial and approach uh, um, methodology. Uh, during uh, COVID, traffic was very, very uh, largely reduced, especially in the first two months. So we implemented a huge set of uh, bike lanes where it was previously unimaginable. And now we are following the data to, uh, to figure out what the reaction uh, of the citizens is. And Apparently, even though uh, the motor vehicle lobby was quite uh, was quite loud uh, publicly, it appears that data is supporting us in the sense that uh, the citizens of Budapest are very much uh, pro uh, the development of uh, the biking facilities in Budapest. This. Uh, uh, approach is also followed where we are trying to reduce uh, traffic in the downtown areas and uh, so uh, this is these are small and gradual transformations uh, another uh, thing which is also connected to the reduction of traffic uh, we would like to redevelop uh, uh, city centers in the districts uh, of Budapest. There are 23 districts in Budapest. Most of them traditionally had their own city center, and these have uh, these have failed in the past decades. And now we would like uh, to re 
to recultivate them or to re recreate them in order to reduce inner traffic in the town so Budapest can uh, can really become a, uh, a city of 10 minutes where you can reach uh, uh, a part of the town which has city center capabilities within 10 minutes. And um, what we are also trying to do is to create a Budapest Global Council where we can uh, uh, open up uh, for PPP partnerships in order to introduce financial means, but more importantly, know-how in the development of the city. So we are looking uh, for much more cooperation uh, of the city, which up to now used to be a closed entity, which we would like to open up to the world, to new ideas, and of course, also uh, to the citizens. So that is uh, basically what is ongoing and what will happen in Budapest in the next few years. And I thank you very much for your attention. And uh, please ask your questions. Thank you, Mr. Kepa for news. Uh, indeed, I also encourage you to post your questions in the question bo box. I see there's already one um, that came in for the previous presentation. So keep them, keep them coming. Uh, anything you would want to have um, have answered. So uh, uh, thanks again to Mr. Kepofernius uh, for the experience of Budapest and also um, letting us in on the mentality change that's currently going on and the um, interesting plans uh, that you have for the upcoming uh, years. Um, I would like now to invite our third speaker, Mr. Ulrich Herning, to turn on his camera and video. Um, to give us uh, his presentation uh, on the city of Leipzig, which has been mentioned a couple of times as one of the rare examples uh, to move from a fellow city to a lighthouse city from one project to the other. So please, um, we're all yours uh, and uh, the floor is yours. Um, yeah, thank you um, for the introduction, Catherine. Um, um, it was very, very, uh, a, a very interested to hear from those two examples from uh, Bono and also from 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 Budapest. Uh, uh, greetings to Bono, which should impact our sister city. So um, I am very much in honor sharing the platform with with, uh, with Bono here on this in this, in this panel. Um, I'm. Um, I think I can control the slides myself. So um, let's go from uh, where are we? Um, your arrows left and right, or up and down? The arrow on your keyboard. Okay, here we are. Okay, so Leipzig. Um, we're the eighth largest city in Germany, largest city apart from Berlin in East Germany. We have about six hundred thousand inhabitants we used to be the fastest growing city in germany we aren't uh, we don't have that title anymore but this has really sort of after uh, a, a sort of years of decline in in the early 90s um where we lost about where where the city lost 100,000 manufacturing jobs within two years where over 80,000 people moved out of the city um, and sort of this this has been sort of the, the, you know the big story of leipzig of growth of, of of attraction uh, over the last um, over the last years, we do have a comparable unemployment rate to the rest of Germany, um, which of course used to be high uh, in the 90s and in the zero years, owing to the uh, to the transition uh, from the socialist economy to uh, to the market economy. Um, Leipzig, as you might know, is the city of music, the city of the trade fairs, has always been sort of the meeting grounds of East and West, even at the time of the division um, of the European of the European continent. So this is something where we we like to uh, continue in that tradition. What have we done in terms of the um, of of our experience with the smart city? With um, um, with uh, I see the presentation now changing somehow. Okay. Anyway. Um, uh, okay. Um, I see. Um, we um, so what have been our 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 measures in in terms of of smart city? I guess what what overlays the current situation, even in the in the post or in the in the COVID nineteen uh, coping strategies and so on, is our 
uh, our dedication to climate change is our uh, driven by our city council in, uh, in in the fall of last year of a climate emergency that was declared and now that of course led us as city as city government uh, to uh, to elaborate the the necessary measures not only in the domain of the city administration but also in the domain of our public utilities, of our traffic company, the energy company, the water company, and so on. And I think this is one of the key uh, learnings and also you know, one of our main challenges that remain. How can we coordinate between uh, the core administration and uh, the domain of our public utilities? And so this translated into, a, uh, into an, an immediate action program, which was now voted in city council in July of 2020, where uh, there are a number of, of measures that are taken immediately to counter um, the effects of climate change. Um, if we continue, uh, let's see, does that, uh, let me see how we can move the slides. Uh, where are we? Okay, here. The smart city process in Leipzig. Um, Leipzig comes from a tradition of, let's say, integrated city planning, um, which was the INSEC, the Integrierte Stadtentwicklung, that came from the zero years, um, but also then moved into the year 2020, uh, was voted again by city council in, in 2018 with an horizon to 2018. Um, and then led to a whole number of strategy documents that were that were drawn up. Uh, we now have the, um, you know, as you can see, we started out with the project Triangulum, where we were a follower city, and are now moving, are now working in the project Sparks, which is which has mainly to do with local energy infrastructure, with um, a number of um, of concrete projects that we are exploring in that context. What we also did, we formed a digital city unit in April of uh, 2019, which is a so, you know, which is aligned in the, in the Directorate of Economic Development. So that is a, a clear decision to align smart city with, with the economic development branch of city government. And one of the, the, the important learnings of that unit formation was less uh, that we need a unit and that we, you know, that we need some, to task some bureaucrats to do things and throw out their networks and sort of f federate and organize and so on, but was the internal governance processes of city government, again, with this duality of, of the public utilities and city government and how to make sure that the two sing from the same song sheet and that they actually... Um, sort of work in the same direction and they don't sort of double things. For example, we've had things you know, happen in the past where uh, two, uh, two separate branches of, of our public utility uh, set up um, you know, electrical vehicle charging stations you know, across the city because they were financed from two different federal programs for, 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 for electric mobility. Where you might say, okay, great, you know, people are doing stuff, people are sort of, you know, moving ahead, and sort of, it's better to sort of innovate and do stuff before you coordinate yourself to death. But on, on the other hand, as we move these things to scale, uh, I think the coordination becomes more important, and this is some of the things that we ask also our leader of that, uh, you know, of that digital city unit, Dr. Ginsel, who's now I think also in the panel or in the in uh, in the audience. And, you know, we, um, this is one of her main tasks to actually. Uh, bound these things together. Um, if we move on, uh, one chart, uh, let's say. Okay, oh yeah, here we are. Um, so this was really one of the key benefits of our of our of of um, of the Triangulum um, era to be a follower city, to not just form the unit, but also to enable that unit to throw out the networks to the public companies, but also to private companies, to scientific institutions, to rally around um, the cause of smart city, uh, and also um, to form these internal processes of, of governance between the city utilities and our city administration. And I think it also provided us with an opportunity to bring our political decision makers on board because it's not enough when you have the mayor or the deputy mayor or the head of the unit being convinced that this is important 
but you also need city councillors, politicians to really come on board and believe and see. So in the in the con in the context of the Triangulum project, we were able to go on study tours to go to I believe Stavanger in Norway, but also to other cities to Finland. Uh, to see how smart cities actually work and how these internal processes work. So this was a very, very important piece of contribution for uh, our our experience in 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 Triangulum. Um, as we move to um, Sparks, uh, we are um, uh, we are now uh, pursuing a number of very concrete uh, projects or, or a, 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 a number of very concrete. Um, well, uh, pieces of work that, um, you know, work packets that we are working on with our city utilities. One is um, the setup of, of, of solar, of, of solar thermic, um, you know, energy networks in, in an area of, um, um, of the city. Another is a, a, a pilot project together with BMW, where we're working to use uh, charging networks and charging stations for electric vehicles as a um, as a as a um, a, you know as an energy repository um, to um, uh, to balance uh, you know for load balancing within energy supply and also uh, to do reverse charging between sort of into the vehicles but also out of the vehicles when sort of um, you know energy or uh, you know uh, um, electricity is not needed so this is a technology we're piloting to, uh, together with, with with BMW in the context of the Sparks project. Uh, uh, another one is the virtual um, is a virtual power plant. Uh, the modeling of, uh, of a virtual power plant. We uh, because we are the seat of the of the European Energy Exchange here uh, here in Leipzig, one of the largest European providers of of of, uh, of, uh, of trading in energy contracts. Uh, there is a certain infrastructure around. Uh, companies that are involved in virtual power plants, uh, um, energy trading, virtual energy networks, and so on. And then as a last concrete uh, work piece, um, we are working uh, with our building company, with also building owners um, on managing of heating systems within, um, within, within buildings. So a lot of it very much focused around the issue of energy, heating, and climate, and this I think makes it uh, you, know, you know makes it resilient also in the face of the of the fiscal challenge uh, we now face because uh, of course we will uh, be coming into um, into severe fiscal pressures under um, under the COVID under the post COVID um, scenarios combined with the challenge of climate change, and so in in fact this is something where we see a great benefit from the Europe from being part of a wider European project because this makes these projects or these work packets not just a a random work packet in the investment plan of our utility but it makes it part of something bigger and so this is where uh, also when we have competing demands for resources uh, this is something where uh, we can maintain these investments and maintain them around the investment into smart city and energy sufficiency. And so I think this is one of the, the key learnings we take away from us also in the, um, in the current situation. So I think this, this was my slides. The rest is, um, is sort of annex in case you want to jump into more questions. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Herning, and also really taking us on that journey um from the experiences in um the triangle um, pro, um, project where you were a, a fellow a follower city and now um the, the implementation in sparks so thank you very much also for highlighting these points and the learnings you took out of each of those stages so thank you um then i would like to hand over to um mr tam um the deputy mayor of the city of tartu um who is going to um share the tartu experience in the smart and city uh, project where they are a lighthouse city. Mr. Tam, the floor is yours. Hello, thank you so much for the possibility to be here and uh, share our experiences, to share our points of view. So um, we have been asked to be here because we are part of the Smart and City Lighthouse project, uh, but the experiences I will speak about are not only related to the Smart and City project. So basically, um, that's all I have collected during my working here in, in the city government. So you will you will have it in, in 10 minutes or, or maybe 12 minutes. 
So um, just to continue, um, a few words about our lovely city. We are the second largest city in Estonia. We are a traditional university city. University was founded here in 1632. And uh, therefore, as, as university has changed the city a lot, we are also saying that um, this human power that we have since uh, establishing university here, we are the smart city also since 1632. So uh, roughly 100,000 inhabitants. Uh, and what is really a great thing for us that we have a relatively young um, share of, uh, of inhabitants here, as we have 50% of people younger than 35 years. We, we have um, about 18,000 students in, in our city. And uh, we have really high share of people who are using uh, internet. We have uh, roughly 90% of people using internet here. And then also 98% of people have a digital ID who are using ID card or mobile ID for, for everyday actions. So um, uh, this kind of um, digital identity is also important for, for the smart city developments. So uh, I have to start with a few statements. Um, based on my, my own ex personal experiences and the experiences in, in, in the city of Tartu. So um, before starting any projects, before going for any, any implementations, you have to really know your strengths and weaknesses and uh, actual challenges. Not try to uh, do something that, uh, that is not really needed. Uh, do only things which, which you actually need to do here. Uh, don't try to be uh, anybody else, um, just be yourself. Uh, if you're a small city, don't try to be a large city. If you're a large city, don't try to compare with small cities. So uh, and then, um, if you know the current status, if you know what is the status of your city, uh, re create really your strategy and tactics based on, on that. And I'm just bringing a few examples. For example, uh, our city here in Tartu, we know that uh, our main strengths are um, uh, for, for the first the compactness of, uh, of the city, not only in uh, geographical terms, but also in case of human relations. So basically, uh, that's a great value that our inhabitants have pointed out, that it's easy to get to the mayor and uh, easy to get to the rector of the university and so on. So we, we really don't have this kind of barriers that you might have in, in larger cities. And uh, what is ha has been always our um, main strength is the green living environment. Uh, so living environment overall is, is really great here and people have decided for Tartu, for example, only because of, uh, of the living environment. And also uh, Tartu is a traditional uh, cultural city. We have diver diverse cultural scheme. So we know that it's our, our strengths. We have to develop it further. And then Tartu is really proud to be the European capital of culture in 2024. So um, that's, that's a good example how we are trying to make one of our main strengths even more and more stronger and, uh, and to make Tartu visible because of, uh, of being a really, really traditional cultural, uh, diverse cultural city. So uh, some examples of, uh, of the challenges what we have, uh, and just to point out that uh, sometimes uh, you might feel uh, differently than the numbers show. Uh, for example, if you are take, taking the energy consumption here in Tartu, you can see on, on the graphics that um, the main part of, uh, of the energy consumption is heat energy. So um, at the same time, if uh, we are trying to decrease our CO2 uh, emissions, you can see that uh, on the next column, that actually heating energy is creating just a small part of, uh, of the CO2 emissions, what we have here in the city. And the main part of CO2 emissions is created by the electricity, what we are using here. So um, you need to know that, that not the, let's say, highest consumption uh, of heat energy is not your everyday headache, but actually our headache is the electricity what we are consuming here. And we have to concentrate on, on the decrease in energy consumption. Or also to get more renewable energy produced here in the region and, uh, and to consume renewable energy. And the second example is uh, model split. So uh, before starting to make any decisions uh, in transportation, we have to know where we are. 
And as you see here on, on the graphics, um, our main headache has been the increase in, in the number of car trips made, made in the city of Tartu. So um, we know that uh, basically 1% a year, uh, the number of car trips is increasing, and we have to create our tactics based, based on that knowledge. So we know that we have to increase the share of public transportation, we have to increase the share of, uh, of cycling uh, or whatever other, uh, let's say, more environmental friendly ways to move around. So um, that's just an example of uh, how you should know your challenges. So um, I have to speak about data because data is uh, so much important in, in uh, smart city developments. Data is important to understand where you are, but uh, data is also important to, to understand uh, how the implementations have, uh, have actually proved to be successful. Because uh, if you don't measure uh, things going on, or if you are not uh, gathering, uh, if you are not gathering data to understand your current situation, uh, then you basically do not know um, what should be the next decision. You do not know if you are thinking the right way or if you are thinking correct way. So um, I really highlight that uh, collecting data uh, is is important, but not just collecting data, but also to use the data in your everyday everyday management. And uh, what we have recently started with, actually in, in the frame of the Smart and City project, uh, it's collecting IoT data. Also, we have now the IoT platform. Um, which, which is collecting the data from different sensors, uh, dif different actuators. So uh, that's, a, that's a new level what we have reached here. Earlier on, we, we didn't have that much uh, IoT-based data available, but now the situation is improving month after month. So uh, one, one example here, uh, how we have actually used the data in, uh, in the real life. So uh, we had the question in our ahead how we could provide the smartest and greenest urban mobility in in a city tar city of tartu a 50 square meter square kilometer city with 100,000 people and uh, actually we used a lot of data to find out uh, for example the bus line network that is the most suitable for the city that uh, we have a certain number of buses and how those buses should drive around here in the city to, to actually service the people in the best possible way. So uh, I have pointed out here uh, uh, five different data sets, but actually we used almost uh, almost uh, 30 data sets for, for analyzing the bus line network and working out the new, new structure of it. So uh, we were using uh, major data sets like mobile positioning data, also demographic data, and then the, of course ticket validation data, but we use different other minor, minor data, data sets also. Uh, one statement uh, I also have to make is that in smaller and uh, maybe also medium-sized cities, you always have uh, limited in-house human and uh, financial resources. So it basically means that our success depends on uh, on the ability to collaborate with other sectors, to collaborate uh, with public sector institutions like other municipalities, also with state, and then also to collaborate with universities and uh, and and companies from the private sector. So um, we do not have. Um, know-how for, for all, all possible activities that might be important to be put into practice in our city. But uh, if uh, we have um, those competencies or, uh, or this know-how at the company level, it's, uh, it's actually up to us how capable we are to actually involve uh, this, this uh, competence also in our everyday city management. So uh, speaking about the importance of state or uh, or the roofing uh, that you have um, above you. Um, I have to go a little bit back in history and the, and the actual uh, foundation uh, or uh, let's say uh, the actual basis for for the smart city have been created by the legislation which has been uh, um, actually implemented at the state level. So we had uh, the Digital Signature Act. Uh, back uh, about 20 years back already, 
from now. And, um, and that created as a, as a good basis to, to build infrastructure on, on this uh, digital signature possibilities. So we had uh, the key public uh, key infrastructure, electronic identity, ID guard and mobile ID uh, also um, already more than 10 years ago, uh, implemented in, in, in Estonia as a country. And it created a great, um, great basis for, for putting into practice different uh, smart city solutions also in, in Tartu. So uh, since that, we have uh, implemented um, service by service, we have implemented the solution by solution, and we have uh, gained quite a lot uh, because of the supporting uh, legislative background, what we have from the state level. Tartu has been paperless city government since 2003 already, for example. And uh, our our real understanding is that we can offer basically all services uh, from the distance uh, that we ha that we have here in in the city and that we have to offer to the, to our citizens. Uh, actually, the city has different roles um, in the creation of a uh, smart city. It's not just um, implementing solutions but it's also um, the importance of creation of ecosystems for example if the city is uh, supporting creation of ecosystems uh, then you have much better like overall possibilities to have local solutions developed you have more companies who are involved in um, in this uh, smart city field you have also um, universities more working with the smart city issues etc etc and the city has to create the environment also, the supportive environment that will enable uh, innovation to take place, that will enable the new solutions to be worked out, etc., etc. So um, uh, also here in Darto, we have worked with many, many companies and many startups. And uh, I'm just bringing one example that also not, not, not always um, the solutions are successful by the end of the day. For example, we tested for uh, for more than one year a hands-free ticketing system for uh, for the public transportation. So it basically means that people are walking to the bus uh, with a mobile phone in the pocket, and they don't have to do any other activities, and, and the ticket is paid. So um, we we had 2,500 users who tested the solution, and at the end of the day, uh, the service provider it was called Chiffy found out that um, it was working in maybe 95% cases and uh, it wasn't working in 5% cases. So we didn't manage to implement it, uh, but, but also these kind of learnings are important and then next time probably the startup will be more successful also. So to continue uh, about creating the ecosystem, uh, I'm also bringing an example. So we have the river which is uh, going through, through the city and um, we have uh, those technology and IT companies which have been uh, uh, setting themselves uh, in the city center area. So uh, they are making each other stronger. They are creating the ecosystem and the city is supporting with different incubation services, with different uh, like uh, fast track uh, Tartu Im implementations, like uh, support for, for creation of um, of um, like uh, community-based activities, et cetera, et cetera. And, uh, and we have our lighthouse, uh, lighthouse event also, which is called Startup Day, which is taking place every year in January. So uh, as, you, as you see, uh, the word Tartu contains also in the word startup. So we have uh, used it for the marketing, um, marketing reasons also. So uh, we are trying to support our ecosystem as much as possible here. And uh, a few other findings uh, from our experiences. Um, of course, we always have the issues of uh, economic barriers and uh, how to ensure funding for different activities. And I highly suggest that uh, take only those activities which you would actually put into practice despite of uh, receiving external support. Of course, it's good to receive external support, but um, if um, external support is making you um, to, to put into practice like those nice to have things, then uh, it's not the best direction to go for. So actually go only for the activities which are important. 
and choose uh, activities which have also political support because uh, in, in, in city management uh, you need political support otherwise uh, you are quite often blocked on, on the way to implement something. So uh, it's important that you have the political support and then also it's important to involve uh, private sector as much as possible to, to realize your dreams. And uh, how to gain political support? Um, always if you are starting any, any major or, or important project, uh, try to make the decision to participate in the project at the highest possible level. In our case it means the city council, which you can see here on the photo also. And, uh, it's, it's really important to involve political decision makers from the very beginning, uh, not when you are, let's say, already far in the way and you have implemented probably something already. You have to involve them from the very beginning uh, and you need a spokesman. If you have a spokesman at the political level, then it's really good thing to happen for your project. And if um, you have kind of supervisory board for the project or, um, or any other like um, like institutions where you could involve politicians, please kindly do it because it will essentially speed up also the process of uh, decision making, and uh, continuously share information about uh, on the project, whatever project it is. But uh, if we, if you are trying to be successful, share the information with the decision makers also. And my last uh, slide, uh, just just to highlight once again, um, based on our uh, smaller city experiences, uh, we have found out that small cities are good um, incubation, incubators for new solutions because uh, we can quite easily implement solutions uh, citywide. We do not need to start this pilot areas, pilot districts. Uh, we quite easily can implement uh, citywide solutions. And also in Tartu, as, as you probably remember from my first slide, we have a lot of people using internet and uh, and using digital uh, identity, we have good basis for uh, for for electronic uh, involvement of people. We have actually people willing to be electronically involved in different processes. So it's up to us how we can design those processes to to offer this solution. And citizens are willing to be, uh, let's say, talking about solutions here and then to give feedback on different implementations. But it's uh, it's our smartness how how efficiently we can involve people, and of course um, the more open we are with sharing information, with sharing uh, different projects, uh, the more secure people also feel, and uh, the more aware people are in in, in our city. And the cities uh, cities are actually quite often saying that people are not any more interested in uh, things going on at the city level and. Uh, they are not really giving feedback because they would not like to be burdened with different information. But in fact, it's not true. It's uh, it's up to your choice of tools. If you are using the right tools, if you are offering people uh, good possibilities to speak uh, and and uh, be be connected to the city, then it's working uh, quite well. So uh, those are my my findings, and uh, thank you so much for for your attention. Thank you very much, Mr. Tam, for this very uh, uh, presentation on the things that are happening in Tartu and also the things you've learned um, over the years uh, in implementing these. Um, I would now like to invite all other speakers to please turn on their cameras and, and the sound. Or let's say first cameras and then once it's your turn, turn on the sound as well. So just make yourselves visible again. Wonderful, it's already three. Um, so just if Mr. Herning is still there and could join us um, by sharing his video again, that would be great. Um, there, thank you very much. They've already been coming in some questions during the uh, using the question panel. Um, I invite the participants to also, if you have questions to one of the speakers or all four, um, please put them in the question panel. Um, it should be on your left-hand side of the menu um, and we can see uh, a few already there. Um, and I would like to first put the first question up, which is actually uh, regarding Leipzig and Leipzig projects. So um, Francisco, if you could put that question live, um, that would be really good. Um, 
Otherwise, um, I can also um, do this. Um, yeah. Okay, so everybody should be seeing the question on their screen. Uh, it's a question towards Leipzig. So if you could move back in time, let's say to the beginning of when the Triangulum project has started, what would you do differently? Uh, so what's your biggest learning in so far which you would like to pass on to the other universities? Yeah, well, thank you. That's a great question. Um, the hypothetical counterfactual uh, of what would have happened. Um, I think one of the biggest... Um, dilemmas of, and that's, I, I, I try to sort of give you my outlook on how sort of the integration into a European project will protect these projects, will protect these investments now that we come into, into fiscal, um, you know, trade-offs and, and, and challenges and, and, and competing demands for, for, for resources within government, but also on, on the public utility side. But one of the downsides of this was in the initial phases of Triangle Room, and even prior to that, was the idea that um, because of very generous European funding in the 90s and the zero years to city development, there was a belief among city, city leadership that, oh, smart city, uh, Europe's going to pay for it. And that sort of meant that you didn't have to bother. And it's not just the money. It's also the question how much time as a mayor or as a leader of utility, how much time of your management time do you commit to these topics? Do you actually sit down for a workshop? Do you spend a day really thinking through this because of data and whatever? These are very sort of complicated issues. And do you actually you know, commit yourself to that or do you sort of move this somewhere into the European funds unit and they'll take care of it, you know? And this, I think, has has probably given us some lag time uh, from, you know, where other German cities stood in, let's say, 2012, 2015, you know, you know, that had already set up proper units, that had already sort of, you know, thought this through and so on, where we still had this somewhere in the European funding unit uh, box, you know, and, and it didn't really concern senior management. And so I think this is something where now that we that you know so, sort of this has moved with the you know you know the you know that this unit has been formed and there is also a proper budget behind it. There is a sort of there's over a million euros that goes into this into this unit of the, the sort of Leipzig city budget, and that has provided a level of sincerity and a level of um, of concreteness also of local decision makers that we could have attained much earlier and. Um, so, uh, be, uh, because the dilemma when it's sort of you know, externally funded, um, you know, the different local actors don't have skin in the game, you know, and so they 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 see it as as maybe superfluous. Whereas if they if they have to fund it from their own budget, be they a utility or be they a unit within city government, they take it much more seriously. So that's Thank my. You. Uh, yeah, thank you very, thank you very much of uh, that uh, retrospective uh, on what you would do differently or what could have been done differently should you start all over. We have another live question to um, Budapest, which you should be seeing now on the screen. So, uh, regarding your presentation, Mr. Kerberfurnius, um, I would love to hear more on how you plan to evolve into a host environment. Where do you start? What's the first step? And what would you consider success in five or ten or fifteen years from now? You're muted at the moment. Okay. Thank you very much for the question. I'm just trying to behave well and then being forgetful, not turning it on. Uh, so this is this is one of the questions that we are um, we are uh, trying to uh, trying to solve, especially because uh, the concept of uh, having private um, public partnerships has been uh, very much discredited in the previous uh, 15 years. So uh, we will have to uh, reinvent this. Um, uh, first, one of, the, uh, one of the first things that we have to do is uh, to try to find out what the capabilities of the capital are right now. So not to uh, start on too many points. Uh, 
the problem is that uh, in under the previous administration, there has been uh, a so-called smart city uh, strategy which has been developed, but the thing is that it is on a very high level, so it is not very actionable, I don't think. So uh, in the uh, uh, forthcoming uh, year or so, we will have to... Uh, we will have to identify the areas that we are going to focus on. I think that is uh, the uh, that is the project for the next six months, and uh, then uh, through the this Budapest Global Council that we have uh, that we have uh, in mind and that I have mentioned in my presentation, we are going to try to. Uh, try to create partnerships in the key areas that we have uh, identified so uh i think it is uh to trying to set up this uh global council to develop a strategy have key players on the board approach key players who are not on the board but who are uh, who are going to be able to work uh with us in this very peculiar um and very strict and i think uh to some extent very counterproductive uh, uh, public procurement environment that we have to work in so um uh and one of the uh i think one of the uh yes basically this is the idea and uh in five years i would like to be uh uh in a city where uh where the approach is basically uh, not why something cannot be done, but rather we are focusing on how things can be done. So I think that is, that is in, in, in very few words, that is where I want to be. Thank you. And I see some nodding there and mm -hmm. thumbs up. So I think that's an environment where, where I guess many cities would like to operate in. Um, so that's a good ambition. Thank you very much for sharing um, and answered elaborating more on this spirit that you have in mind and that you're trying to establish. Um, there's also one more question on Tartu, uh, for Tartu or about Tartu presentation. So um, the comment is, it was great to hear about the database development of public transport or your research on buying bus tickets automatically when you earlier, when you enter the vehicle. Um, I was wondering what was the first trigger to start these projects and do you have a team or department dedicated to smart city development in touch? Thank you so much for the question. Um, actually, the trigger uh, to work with, uh, let's say, different implementations related to public transportation uh, is a model split what we have here in the city. It basically means that the share of public transportation should be higher. In our opinion, uh, we have to decrease the number of car trips made in, in the city. And that's why we have concentrated a lot of activities into, into public transportation development and then also into, into cycling development, etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. So um, that's actually the trigger. We have to change the model split here in, um, in, in our city because if um, the continuing 1% increase in car trips every year is continuing, um, then in, in 20 to 30 years we might have real, real problems here. Um, like like we have in the larger cities right now but, uh, but also in tartu it might it might be a great problem so that's why and and uh, also we have uh, different project managers who are taking care of uh, of uh, different implementations uh, different uh, city projects so that's um, that's our structure how we are handling it and then of course we have people who are willing to to think about different implementations who would like to propose different new solutions uh, so that's that's how it's working here. All right. Thank you. Thank you very much also for answering that question. Um, so if there are more questions from the audience, please keep them coming. I hope you can find the spot to, to place them. So it's the little question uh, box that appears on your left hand side of the menu. Um, and um, I know that there is um, also one now coming up for um, Bruno. And I'm going to put it live. So regarding the Spitalka district, the great project, thank you for sharing. I was wondering how did the citizens react to it? Did you have a chance to receive any comments from people living and working nearby? Um, and then a separate question is how are you planning to heat the space? But maybe first on the citizens, if you might want to share your experience. 
Uh, so um, the reaction of the people were very good. Uh, we did it also through newspapers, and now we do the round tables. We did also the round table with the owners in the place. Because, as I said before, the place is really complicated. It's really near to the city center, almost in the neighborhoods, like one street behind. And uh, these uh, these ownerships are quite long, long um, uh, properties. So uh, the restructuring of the place will be completely uh, not under under the ownership uh, places. So we did also. Uh, the uh, the meeting with the with the people, and uh, I think just the reaction in common we can say is uh, it is quite late that you uh, do this thing. Yeah, uh, all the people know that it is just the neighborhood of the city center, and it's empty. It's uh, it's uh, the place is not very beautiful because it's something like a brownfield, as I said. So the reaction the the reaction is really good. And also the connection with the with the heating uh, heating plant is really good for the smart solution. So uh, this plan, uh, this place, which is a part of the uh, former factory for the heating plant factory, will be empty. They will they will they will leave it, and they can support it by the new technologies from from this uh, from this heating plant. So the combination is also really good from this point of view from the energy. Thank you. Thank you very much um, for those further details. Um, as I don't see uh, any immediate questions from the audience, I would still have um, a couple uh, dedicated to, um, to each of you. So um, maybe, uh, as we've heard last from Tartu, but um, uh, being a lighthouse city, um, has actually COVID-19 implemented uh, affected any of the implementation in the, in the short term, or have you changed direction? Uh, as a result of the crisis? Mm -hmm. uh, thank you so much for the question. Uh, of course, COVID-19 has had, um, let's say, huge impact on different activities in, in the city. But uh, regarding the Lighthouse project implementation, uh, we are actually uh, implementing most of the activities that we had to implement in, in the frame of the Lighthouse project. So we are really in approaching the finish line uh, quite, uh, in, quite in the nearest future. So basically, what it affected, it's, uh, it was a little bit the retrofitting of the buildings because uh, people were not actually willing to let um, those construction guys uh, to let them into the apartments and, uh, and to take care of different uh, repairing works or construction works. So uh, that was one of one of the obstacles that was on on our way. But, um, but if we are taking the broader picture, um, it, it doesn't, didn't affect that much our, our implementations. Okay. That's, of course, good news <laughs> overall. Um, thank you very much. Uh, and then maybe going to our other uh, Lighthouse City of, of Leipzig. Um, you've also mentioned quite a lot of interesting new developments in terms of regarding technology. Uh, but do you, do you think that the smart city technologies play a role uh, especially now in the adaptation to post-COVID-19 scenario. Well, thank you for the um, for the question. Um, I believe they they play more of a role. The smart city technologies play more of a role in our uh, path towards climate adaptation, and I think this is where um, you know this is where we also need sort of really more innovative stuff uh, from what we did in the immediate. Uh, COVID cap uh, sort of COVID-19 coping in the different health units or social care units or so. Um, I think this is stuff being done on the basis of current systems. For example, we had in our local health, uh, public health agency, we had people you know, basically shifting paper from one end of the building to the other. And I, 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 you know, I, I send in uh, three database developers and within two weeks they you know, they, they, they sort of build a database and within, you know, within another two weeks, they had this all in this one database. And, and this was like marvel, you know, they've never, they had never seen this before, you know, that you could actually do things on different ends of the building in one system, you know, so um, uh, because they're all doctors and they love paper, you know, and so this is, but this all happens within sort of what we're already doing, you know, and, and not, um, and, and, and probably, 
you know, if we bring in too much stuff from the outside, like if we do a hackathon with, with, uh, with people from the outside, culturally, this would sort of, you know, lead them to sort of, you know, repulse this and say, oh, no, we can't accept. Whereas if it's from within city government, uh, you know, it, it's more accepted. Uh, so that's on the immediate COVID response side, but on this sort of the general sort of, you know, smart city, uh, you know, works will, will help us, um, in, in, in our, you know, energy transport and all of these major challenges, heating, cooling, you know, how do we cool a city, you know, that's overheating in the summer, you know, um, how do we bring the right cooling technologies to what part of the city and what data. And I think that we have a lot to learn and where, you know, in, in terms of what, what, you know, also Tartu, you know, talked about, you know, internet of things and, you know, sensing data, um, I mean, we have you know, sort of way to, you know, way to go, miles to go before we can actually make this productive. I see Mr. Capofroni is nodding. Any additions from your side? I think there's quite some similarities, at least in the approach. So uh, yes, and also one of the, uh, 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 one thing that we have to solve is that uh, being a very controlling city, our city administration actually works uh, in quite an isolated manner from uh, from citizens. So basically, uh, uh, one of my goals is actually to enhance the interaction between the two. So uh, between citizens and people working in the administration. So it's not only, uh, yes, it is a cultural change uh, and it may, uh, may have uh, big disadvantages if too many ideas come from the outside, but working uh, in an isolated manner actually uh, makes the city quite unable to respond to actual challenges within the city. So my, uh, my goal is to enhance the interactions between concerned citizens and people working on the solutions in the city administration. And uh, we have a culture of actually having people working, uh, politicians taking uh, people working in the city administration to meet the public when there are risky situations. So when the, pop, uh, when the politician cannot be very popular, then he pushes the uh, administrator or the, uh, or the officer forward. Uh, um, we are trying to be a bit more cooperative in the sense, uh, in this sense to really create uh, uh, an environment where uh, people outside and inside the city hall uh, can be working constructively together. So, yes. And for this future uh, constructive collaboration, do you see COVID-19 rather as a challenge or an opportunity? Uh, I think uh, uh, it, is, it is an opportunity uh, because we have uh, somehow everyday life was transformed into an online way. So it's... Uh, and, and you're able to create uh, much more regulated discussions, much more, uh, and, and somehow, uh, even though this is in an online, uh, uh, online environment, distances seem to uh, diminish or, or are restructured. So the conversation is actually uh, made somewhat easier. That is my experience. So, and then the task is to maintain this even uh, even after COVID has disappeared or we're uh, getting back somehow to the normal uh, in reality type of conversations. Okay. Thank you. And then maybe a question also to our host and Bruno. Um, do you see do you see a shift in priorities? Um, because you've highlighted quite a number of plans and, and, and uh, objectives that you have. But is there do you observe a shift there uh, now uh, in the COVID-19 situation? Of course, uh, there is uh, the main problem is uh, that the finance situation of the city is now changing very quickly. We don't have much more proposals like uh, uh, what we can uh, wait now. So it's changing like every month. It's uh, worse and worse. So of course, uh, at the end of the year, we will have to make uh, big decisions where we can save the money, how we can somehow earn the money if it's necessary for some investments because uh, the the time before was very optimistic that's why we have quite big projects which costs a lot of money we are quite a big city something like big halls and big streets and also spitalka is very big project 
So uh, at the end, we have to decide which uh, project will prolong and which not. And uh, this is something which we don't know now. But uh, I think uh, the change must come, and I hope uh, that um, some very important project, as I think Spitalka is as well, will prolong, and something which is connected a little bit to sport, to culture, and things like this can wait a little bit, and we will have to uh, make decision after the situation will develop. We don't know it now. No, I think many things are uncertain. Um, just before rounding off the, um, the session, I have a, a few more uh, uh, questions from the audience and I would like to ask you for very short, succinct answers. Uh, there are two questions primarily directed towards Leipzig, but if anybody else wants to intervene, let me know. The first one is regarding Leipzig. How are you currently engaging citizens on policy matters? Do you have a digital platform in place to let citizens participate on things like city budgets, etc.? Yeah, we, we, we do have a, um, a participatory budget process that will come online now in the next budget period. We've had sector-specific citizen dialogues um, in the last years where we thought it would be better to have citizens engaged on a concrete topic like housing or transport uh, instead of having the whole city budget of 2 billion euros up for debate. That's what we have city council for. We also have um, the city strategy, the city digital strategy uh, will be, I'd say, half of the work time of our digital city unit will be spent on citizen engagement. So it's one, of course, working towards the utilities, partners, and city government, but also the other engaging uh, the population on uh, how they feel, also the digital civil society, as I'd call it, on how they feel about, uh, you know, our digital path forward. Great, thank you. And then maybe as a fo as follow-up, um, there, somebody was intrigued by the digitalization of the administrative documents. So how are your offices dealing with dual archiving of information, the digital and physical? And are you changing the laws about storing of physical documents? Uh, in fact, there is a state law on, on digital archiving and we have to comply with that state law as a, as a, as a municipality. And we uh, are setting up a digital archive um, as a joint corporative platform of the um, of the municipalities in our state of Saxony and uh, that is being uh, launched at the moment and of course nobody wants to pay for it so we're in the process of uh, what is an archive is it a common good is it a private good how do we uh, pay actually for the storage space and for what comes into this archive and I think this is a, a topic that will uh, will have to gain uh, important attention because archives are at the basis of accountable democracy and we need to also maintain them uh, for the future. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, our time for the session has uh, run up. So thank you to our four uh, speakers for their very interesting presentations, uh, very detailed. And what I like most, it's also a lot of personal experience in there, because that what this, uh, what this session and this meeting is about, to learn from each other, to exchange experiences. Um, and not repeat uh, possible mistakes uh, somewhere else uh, as well. So thank you very much for uh, those wonderful presentations. Thanks for the audience to put up those questions. Um, I would like to now um, invite you for the virtual or actually on-site lunch break, uh, depending on where you are. We will continue again uh, in an hour's time um, with the um, breakout sessions. So there will always be two parallel sessions which you can find in uh, the program. But as well, there is, of course, the matchmaking, um, which I uh, invite you to have a look at. So you can find all of that in the lobby. Uh, that's your anchoring point from where you can move on to many different and exciting activities for the lunch break now, but also for the afternoon. So thanks again, everybody, for your active participation, the speakers and the audience. Uh, and we'll be back after lunch. So thank you very much. Goodbye. Thank you very much. Goodbye. Thank you.